Uh, also, in between each speaker, I'll be um, uh, putting up a, a series of polls. We only have three questions just to ascertain uh, your thoughts on cycling. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll start. So first of all, I'll hand over to Casey. Hi, good morning, everyone. As Ringo said, my name is Casey McLean. I'm the service manager for the Travel Plan Network team. And I'm just going to cover a little bit about what the Travel Plan Network is before passing over to the other speakers. I don't want to say next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just quickly, uh, the Travel Plan Network, we are a free support and advisory service to businesses. We sit within economic services in the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. We do have a growing network of over 500 businesses. We've got about 539 at the moment. They come from all sectors and all sizes across um, West Yorkshire. Mainly what we are here to do is to support and encourages, encourage businesses to help their employees travel sustainably. So whether that is to work, from work or during work, and also to signpost the sustainable travel offers and provide any expertise that will help ultimately reduce single occupancy car use. We encourage all modes of sustainable transport. So things like cycling, walking, public transport, car sharing, car club, and things like park and ride as well. Just some key uh, business support that we provide. So things like park and ride, car park management sessions, staff events. We do referrals to cycling and walking support, discounted public transport, business relocation, travel plans, and peer-to-peer -peer connections throughout our network. We'll also provide intensive support to any businesses who may require it. And that intensive support can be in many different ways. So it may be around cycling, it may be around walking, or surveying public transport. We'll develop shared travel plan sites and we're also currently developing some travel plan network forums. So that'll allow people who take part in them to develop a shared strategy and also to share resources and share good practice through peer-to-peer -peer support. As I've mentioned as well, we do surveying, so we will monitor commuter behavior, uh, track, analyze the modal shift, that happen as a result of any interventions that we put in place. So why does sustainable travel matter? I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. It's just a couple of headline sentences there. So the UK has set a target of being net zero commitment by 2050. And here in West Yorkshire, our net zero target is 2038 at the latest. Transport itself contributes to over a quarter of the domestic greenhouse gases. Some other things that are a little bit more local to us, Bradford Clean Air Zone will be introduced in 2022. And um, there's also an impact on business productivity when it comes to sustainable travel. A couple of reasons why businesses should engage. There's a lot of evidence that shows that employers that invest in appropriate workplace health initiatives to support the well-being of their staff, we'll see a potential significant return on investment. Car use negatively affects business productivity. So for example, uh, your employees being stuck in traffic jams, congestions, or if you have freight vehicles or um, delivery vans traveling from A to B and they're stuck in traffic, they'll obviously be delayed. Same with business travel, the amount of time people spend traveling. And employees who are physically active Will take, they say, up to 27% fewer sick days than their colleagues. So the main reason why we are here today is to talk about cycling. So the Travel Plan Network can support businesses with cycling in various different ways. We'll do referrals and introductions to our colleagues in City Connect. We can provide peer-to-peer -peer member support uh, from other uh, members who have implemented successful cycling initiatives. We can support with staff surveying which will help to identify any key, key areas of support that your staff will need and to understand any staff barriers as well. Additional to that, free advice, support and signposting. OK, so what's in it for you as somebody who would consider cycling? I'm not going to go into these in much detail because I know that our speakers will cover them off in their presentations, but a few things that would benefit you if you decided to cycle to work rather than taking the car. It will save you money, 
It's easier to fit exercise into your day. It'll also save you time. There's many health and mental health benefits. Cleaner air, less pollution. It'll reduce your carbon footprint. It'll make you more productive at work. No more traffic jams and no more parking space stress. So trying to find that space, uh, taking up so much time in the morning. Um, so that's a couple of different benefits. What I'm going to do now is pass over to other speakers. So we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. So back to you, Ringo. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Caroline, if you want to uh, just introduce uh, City Connect. Morning, everyone. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Caroline Pinter. I'm a business travel plan advisor with the Travel Plan Network and I cover the Calderdale and Kirklees districts. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of City Connect, um, who are kind of like our sister department here in the Combined Authority. Um, so City Connect's remit is around growing cycling um, as an activity um, in West Yorkshire. And they do that primarily through um, delivery of infrastructure programmes. So, for example, you may have seen um, the Leeds to Bradford Cycle Superhighway. And um, for those of you in Leeds or who used to work in Leeds, um, Wellington Street, I believe, is being dug up as we speak um, for, um, for cycle paths. But they also have, and what's of particular interest to this group, is the, the Bike Friendly Business Scheme. Um, so with the Bike Friendly Business Scheme, your business or organisation can be eligible for a grant for grant funding of up to £5,000 to pay for cycling infrastructure at your premises. So that scheme is um, has supported three org 300 organisations in West Yorkshire. Participating businesses see a 20% uplift in people riding a bike. Um, as I said, the grant funding is up to £5,000. Um, that can pay for if you wanted a fleet of e-bikes, uh, if you were in need of a shower room at your premises uh, for secure bike stands. What I will do is I will drop um, the information on that plus the application form into the chat but we'll share it afterwards. I'll also put in the chat um, City Connect's route planner as well. That gives um, information on different types of route. So if you want, if you're a more confident cyclist, um, it will pick out uh, faster routes, more challenging routes. But if um, if you're a novice, it will pick out easier routes that are more away from traffic. Um, so I'll do that now and I'll hand back to Ringo. Thank you for that, Caroline. So I'm just going to run one poll question. So uh, hopefully everyone can see this when I launch it. So hopefully everyone can see that. So how do you currently or previously uh, commute to work? So you've got a series of options there. I uh, appreciate you may sometimes uh, do a mixture of those. So it is, you can pick multiple options. So if you like, say, cycle and then you get the train or you walk. OK, I think everybody's done that. That's great. OK, so I'm going to now hand over to our first speaker, Leah. So thank you again, Leah, for attending. If you can introduce yourself and uh, yeah, go for your part. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, that was a little bit like who wants to be a millionaire with kind of like ask the <laughs> audience, wasn't it? It's quite exciting seeing the live thing, see what the answer is. Um, I'm Leah Stewart. I am a director of a company called Civic Engineers. Um, and um, my, my profession is that I'm a civil engineer and I'm a transport planner. So I do talk about this kind of thing in my professional life as well. I, um, I, live, in, uh, I live in Huddersfield. I work full time at the moment. I'm based in Leeds. I'm working a mixture of part, um, part time from home and part time from, from uh, our Leeds studio, which is in the South Bank in, in, uh, in Leeds. Um, I've got three children. Uh, they're aged 14, 10 and 7 at the moment. Um, 
and professionally as I say I talk about active travel a lot so it's kind of been important to me over my life to test that what I promote at work is is feasible for people's real real life so I've kind of been running a 20-year one-woman experiment in how to incorporate active travel you know walking cycling into my day my daily commute and how to manage this as a mother of three children um, and, and fit in fit that into our family life as well I mean I do also have a car so I, I use that but I, I'm I have been sort of making an effort to observe how to uh, travel more actively throughout my life so what I'm going to tell you I'm going to tell you a bit about my commuting story I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that I've had on that and how I've overcome them. I'm, I'm going to touch on why this matters to me. So my story, um, I used to live in London. I'm from Yorkshire originally, uh, but I went down to London because apparently the streets are paved with gold there. Um, and I went down with a running away from home stick over my shoulder. I didn't really. But I used to live in London uh, and I drive for me there when I lived there, driving and owning a car wasn't an option. I think that's had a really big influence on me. Um, I, I wouldn't have ever driven to work in London. It's not really possible. I also, so that's one of the reasons why I sort of came to not driving to work. I also started going out with a cycle courier uh, and he persuaded me to bring my bike to London. And I don't know if you know many cycle couriers, but they tend to cycle like crazy people. So my first experience, I got to London with my bike, unloaded off the train, and we went straight into the busiest road in London. It felt like I went down the London Euston underpass, which is like, um, you know, the, the motorway that goes around the north of Leeds? It was a little bit like that. It was like a concrete chasm with cars just zooming through. And he was like, come this way. So we cycled through there. It was absolutely terrifying. Um, and and uh, that was my that was my kind of christening to cycling in in a city um, I actually was fortunate at the time to work for Transport for London and they gave me some training in in how to actually handle myself on the road so that helped quite a lot but as the years went on I lived in London for about eight years I, I became a cyclist I, I cycled to work I think the, the, my maximum commute is about eight miles each way and I, I don't think I ever did it five days a week I did it maybe three days a week I'd be like going out the other days or something like that anyway I uh, married the cycle courier we had our first child I got um he, he was he stopped being a cycle courier actually um but uh, yeah we had our first child I got my child on the back of the bike I got my son on the back of the bike when when he was about nine months old and he really loved it um and then we decided that we would move back to Yorkshire because it's so great um so we moved to Leeds and I we lived in uh, Meanwood and I worked in the center of Leeds and I used to take my son to nursery on a, on my bike um, and then I'd cycle on to work um, and that worked out really well it was like a really guaranteed way of knowing what time I would get back to the to the nursery as well on, on the way home um, it was the most reliable journey time that I could that I could find and actually quicker than driving I think a lot of the time um, I, we then moved to Huddersfield and I did the same but I would take take him to, to Childminder and then go on to the station on my bike and then um, get the train into Leeds um, I have cycled while pregnant. I think that I actually found it easier than walking because it was less impact on my my sort of poor burdened hips. I actually cycled to hospital when I was 41 weeks pregnant. Again, not because I'm a crazy cyclist, but more because it was the most convenient thing to do. And in that instance, I just kind of hoped it would kickstart labour because uh, I, my baby was not going to come out, but it didn't work, actually. So, uh, yeah, I can't recommend or not recommend that but it didn't work for me that kick-started labor like that so now what I do now um, I think the pandemic has changed a lot of our lives and certainly it's changed my life so it's changed the way that that I work working from home a lot more um, and also just the way that I think employers are looking at um, productivity and uh, flexibility as well so um, I now drop my children to school whereas I think before we'd have engaged in some sort of you know very early morning dashing about but but now I drop my children to school so we walk to school it's just over a mile up to, to school from where we where we live uh, me and my two youngest children walk up to school there and I push my bike often laden with all their book bags and coats and everything and then I cycle from the school to Huddersfield train station which takes me about 10 minutes it's all downhill and then I catch the train to Leeds um, I've got a folding bike which I take on the train sometimes so I, I cycle to from Leeds station to my office in the South Bank so that's my commuting story. Um, I'm going to just talk about a couple of the challenges that I've had um, and how I've overcome them. So I think the first challenge is actually trying something different and actually doing it in the first place. 
Um, and I think, you know, the confidence. So, so I was flung into it, as I say, by cycling on this really frightening road. Um, and that was that that was uh, yeah a bit of a baptism of fire for me. But actually, once you try something different and realise that it, it can work, then or or just try it once a week, then that can make a really big difference. And and then you realise that it is feasible. So, it's really the first thing is about the confidence to switch and try it and find find out what works for you as well. Um, and similarly, when I started taking the children on the back of my bike and things like that, that that actually became quite feasible and quite enjoyable, really. Um, the next issue, the next challenge is about not having the right gear. Now, I've tried lots of things. I've tried going to work in cycling clothes and getting changed at work and having a shower. But nowadays, I cycle in my normal clothes and I take it easy so I don't have to get changed. Um, and I found that cycling in high heels is actually easier than walking in high heels. Um, so I can wear kind of my smart work clothes and, and cycle. Uh, I've used the cycle to work scheme three times altogether over the years to buy different bikes and equipment and that spread spread the cost for me and actually saved the money for me and for my employer as well. So I've actually persuaded my employer to, to do that. That was, that was a long time ago. I think a lot of employers do do the cycle to work scheme now and it really is excellent. Um, I think we're going to touch on that later in this seminar. Um, so now I've got, I either use my folding bike, which means I can use it both ends of the train. And, and actually, I often visit other cities like Manchester or London. And I take my folding bike on the train, then I get off uh, in one of these cities and off I go. And I feel all pleased with myself about that. It's great. Um, and I've also got a kind of shop, ladies shopper bike with a big basket on the front and a rack at the back so I can get all the school bags in it or, or I can get the Christmas shopping in it if I've picked that up at, in Leeds at lunchtime. So, uh, you know, that I've actually... Can carry quite a lot on on my bike um another challenge is the weather um which actually when when i've cycled isn't that um isn't that much of a challenge because you don't actually often get very soaked it's it's um the weather's sort of not as bad as you think I mean, it depends how long your journey is as well but again that's down to getting the right gear and working out what works for you with the journey distance and stuff i mean interestingly um, the weather in Yorkshire isn't that different from Copenhagen, where they cycle all the time. So it's it's sort of about equipment and, you know, you don't get soaked that often. That's what I found anyway. Another challenge is topography as well. I have from my house, it's a four minute, five minute cycle to the station in Huddersfield. But it's about 10 minutes back because there's quite a steep hill. So I suppose uh, topography is just allowing a bit more time on the way home. But also I get stronger and I've got fitter as well. So. Um, and, you know, the next stage would be electric assist, which is quite exciting, all the electric bikes that are on the market now. Um, one challenge I've not managed to overcome is having tidy hair, which um, which reminds me I probably need to get a hairbrush to keep at work. But again, that's about the facilities you've got to work and how you organise yourself. And, and it hasn't ever quite, um, I haven't ever quite got to the very tidy hair stage of life, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to just talk about why this matters to me. And I think the first thing to say is that actually it's a lot of fun and commuting this way with my children, particularly walking up to school at the moment. It's such a lovely time of day to walk up to school with them and talk to them and not have any jobs or the dishwasher to unload and all of that kind of thing. We bump into friends. We've all agreed. My middle son, he's 10. He said, it's just such a fresh start to the day. And I think they enjoy that space and time before school as well. Um, and, and, you know, I then enjoy a really fun 10 minute cycle downhill to the station. And, and that's the second point, really, is that actually it's quite convenient. I, I don't think I could get I race cars and buses and stuff down to the station. And I know that I'm faster than them. and I don't have to find anywhere to park. Um, so it's actually it's actually pretty quick to get around as well. Um, and then when I'm on the train, I can work or I can read or I can catch up on sort of life admin, um, which which I often do. It gives me 20 minutes. So I'm not in in um, in the car um, stuck on the motorway, which I think would I would find quite stressful. I think to mention that it's cost effective, I have over the years saved a lot of money on childcare by being able to um, save time, sort of condense my day, plan it quite because it's a very reliable journey time actually cycling. And I've been able to save money on childcare by by traveling in this way and and saving time because I think you know when when you've got children in, in childcare, then time is money so making sure that you can be there on time and when you say you will be it's really has been really important 
and then healthy and I think we've all I think um Casey touched on this actually traveling like this has kept me in really good physical and mental shape as well and it means that I can incorporate exercise into my daily life without any sort of particular ad additional effort so um I've I, I think it's you know it's been of great benefit to me and my family so I suppose you could ask how's my experiment going and I think it's going well actually I've, I've sort of adapted myself as I've gone along and my family circumstances have changed um I've cycled through three, three pregnancies um I've had children on the back of my bikes I think we've got a bike trailer but that doesn't tend to get used on the commute um and and now it's sort of um it's it's uh it's working well for me and my family at the moment um, I've come through the terrors of the Euston underpass and I've evolved it to, to accommodate different you know, distances, the children, all of that kind of thing. And I think it's something that really contributes positively to my life. So I, I can't recommend it highly enough, really. Um, and I guess that's why I'm here. But I'm happy to talk about things later. That's I think that's all I've got to say for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Leah, for that. It's certainly a very interesting uh, story and, 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 sh and for sharing your experiences, uh, very inspiring as well. So hopefully that will inspire a few people as well or, or give some tips and how to start it as well. So thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to run another poll question. So question number two. Hopefully everyone can see that now. So would you consider cycling to work? So yes, no, not sure, or only if the right facilities are in place, showers, lockers. Great stuff. Okay, some positive results there. So thank you for that. Uh, I'll introduce the next speaker, uh, Craig. Hi there. Thank you, Craig. Hi, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ringo. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name's Craig. Um, I uh, work for the Combined Authority, um, and my work base is uh, Wellington, Wellington House on Wellington Street, which is right next to the train station in Leeds. Um, obviously, due to the pandemic. It's mostly from home. I've actually been in the office three times, I think, uh, this year, um, trying to get in once a week from now on. So I haven't done any commuting for well, it must be 18 months now, isn't it? So um, this is what I'm talking about is pre-pandemic and also po what I'm probably going to do post-pandemic. Um, so I was going to do very something very similar to Leah. Um, going to take you through my commute story, um, why I decided to do it and why I've kept doing it. Um, and also, hopefully, um, my top tips that might um, might help 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 people out if they are thinking of of um, commuting to work as well, which I would absolutely definitely say do if you can. Um, it's great. Um, so I started commuting into work in 2005 um, when I um, got a job with Leeds City Council actually um, previously, um, but I'd. Um, previously worked for Kirklees Council, so I'd done the commute in the car along the M62 from uh, Woodlesford in Leeds all the way through to Kirklees, middle of uh, Huddersfield. Um, and you can imagine what the commute from Huddersfield is first thing in the morning and last thing at night in the car on the M62. Um, and that was actually one of the reasons why I moved to uh, work in Leeds, because I wanted an easier commute and I wanted to actually be able to do it on my bike as well. Um, um, because um, I'm a keen mountain biker, so I wanted to, to get back on my bike as well uh, and do something to go to work with it. Um, so when I first started, as I say, I worked in Woodlesford. Uh, sorry, I lived in Woodlesford. Um, so I cycled in from Woodlesford to Leeds. I generally did three days a week. I didn't really do five days a week. Uh, the reason for that is that um, I went mountain biking on a Wednesday evening, so I didn't want to tie myself out and also I use Friday as a rest day because I go mountain biking on the Saturday all day as well. So um, it, it was limited to three days. Um, I was lucky in respect that they had um, decent cycling facilities at Leeds City Council when I worked there and also at the Combined Authority when I started at the Combined Authority. Um, so my I actually had a couple of route choices from Woodlesford to Leeds. Um, as a mountain biker, I obviously prefer to keep off road. I, 
I, I stay away from roads if I can. And if I go on roads, I try, tend to stick to the quieter roads. So I got the from Wilsford. I'm really it's really good in that you can drop down to the canal and come virtually all the all the way into Leeds. In fact, you can come all the way to to the arm the Royal Armouries on the canal from Wilsford. It's a really e easy commute. Um, when I did it pre-pandemic, um, I did it in all weathers. It could get very muddy, um, and I often came into the office looking as if I'd, I'd been mountain biking for two hours. People tend to stare at me when I walk in the office, but at least we had showers. Um, but typically, since the pandemic, um, I'm not sure who's funded it, probably Sustrans, probably British Waterways, but they have completely resurfaced the whole the whole route in from Wilsford to Leeds now. And you generally, you don't get, you can't, you don't have to go through puddles or anything. Um, it's, it's, they've done a fantastic, fantastic job actually. Um, so the only bit of road I actually did was when I got to the Royal Armies and then find my way through town um, up to up to the station basically. Um, but the other route is, is on road and actually the way I tended to work it is in the morning I went on the canal because I, I wanted to get some fresh air and um, see the surroundings um, and I didn't mind getting muddy and so forth like that. Um, but when I come home, I'm generally a bit tired, I'm feeling a little bit lazy um, and the roads, the road version route is, is a bit quicker to get home and a bit and less muddy as well of course it's about six miles on the road seven miles on the canal so there's not a lot in it um, so I tended to be a little bit lazy and come back on the road and strangely enough I always felt safer on the road coming back to Woodlesford than I did going in to Leeds from Woodlesford just because of the um, the road layouts um, and I felt completely safe coming home actually on the roads but not so much going in on the roads um, and it usually took me about 30 minutes, which is pretty much exactly the same as you would take to get from Wilsford to Leeds on the train or the bus or, or by car, actually. So it was pretty much um, um, the same time, same time. Um, during the pandemic, though, um, we've actually moved up to Otley. So I haven't commuted in from Otley yet. So that's my next um, experience. My next task is to work out how to get in from Otley all the way into Leeds because it's obviously a lot further, it's 12 miles. Um, I will probably try to come in all the way on my bike, but to be honest, I doubt if I'll do that much. And I think that my plan will be um, doing a bit, doing a, using two modes, as in um, riding over to um, Geisley or Menston and then getting the training from, from Geisley and Menston. Um, if anybody, you know what it's like up in Otley though, that means I've got an extremely tough hill to go up and then back down again to get to Geisley in particular, but um, that is actually uh, great for the fitness and so forth. Um, but again, that would only take me 25 minutes, I would I would guess, at the end of the day. Um, so why do I commute? Um, quite a few reasons, really. As, as I've mentioned, I'm a keen mountain biker, so I enjoy cycling anyway. Um, so it gets me out. Um, the main reason I would say is that because uh, I do mountain biking, I, I like to keep as fit as I can so I can keep up with the, um, the people that I go out with. So I'm not at the back of the pack, so I can get at least into the middle of the pack, if not at the, at the, the, the top of the pack. Um, so it's really about fitness for me. Um, and I have missed it over the last 18 months during the pandemic. I have lost a bit of fitness. I go out mountain biking still, but I have lost my fitness. And I'm sad to say I have put a few pounds on as well, unfortunately. So I need, I'm looking forward to getting back into the office so I can start doing that as part of the, of the daily routine. Um, but it also wakes you up in the morning. Um, it gets you ready for work. It gets you in the right um, frame of mind, mind frame. Um, and when you come home on the night time, I think it chills you out. You start, you forget about work. Um, by the time you get home, you've forgotten about work. Um, because you're concentrating on the cycling, you're not thinking about work as you travel home and you're traveling into work as well. It's just a, a nice time. I think it's different to a, being sat in your car or sat on the train or the bus. I think you do tend to think about work when you're doing that, but you don't on a cycle for some reason, or I certainly don't anyway. Um, so I find not from just from a physical aspect, I find it really good for, for mental health, actually, um, getting out there and doing something in the fresh air really really helps me actually um, um, 
because you don't think about those work pressures or life pressures either even um it is it's green as well obviously um and that is part of it um so i'm i'm, I'm keen to support it from from that point of view um and, that, and then the really um big one actually that you probably don't think about actually is it gives you complete flexibility you can leave you can go to work at any time you can leave at any time you don't have to work your way around bus times and train times you don't have to sit at bus stop for 10 minutes and wait for a wait for it if it's been cancelled or it's late or anything like that you just literally go down down the stairs get on your bike and you're straight home and you know exactly what time you're gonna you're gonna get home so it's really great from that point of view and i think the other good thing about commuting is is that we all struggle to find the willpower or time to actually do some fitness ex some exercises to keep you fit and so forth um put it in as part of your routine as go of going to work you don't have to think about that it just becomes natural and it just it just puts it as part of your your daily routine um, to get in there so uh, just on to my my personal top tips and these obviously won't work for everybody um, is if you do decide to commute uh, work out what route suits you to get into work um, as I say I prefer to stay off road but others might be quite comfortable on the road depends where you live and where you're going to of course and how well the road system set out and um, the cycle network and so forth um, but yeah work that one out um, I think Caroline mentioned there's a route planner on the City Connect, but there's also other ones around. I think uh, Cycle UK certainly do one. Uh, there's a, I know there's cycle maps for Leeds particularly, and I'm sure there's for the other West Yorkshire towns and so forth. But there's also stuff like there's a um, a, um, a cycling app called Commut, which is more which is more off road. So that'll tell you more off road routes if you don't want a, an on road route. So there's all sorts of all sorts of stuff out there. Um, but the key is um, um, have a look, plan one out, but try it, try it out before you do your first commute, just so you're comfortable with it. Um, and at the end of the day, you probably know the roads much better than the route planners do. Actually, if you even if you drive and walk around, so you'll know what the uh, the best the best route in is. Is um, um, for me um, and. Particularly, I think if you're going over three or four miles, you will probably need something at the end of your journey so you can get cleaned up, so you can get showered. Um, I think that's really important. It's certainly important for me. Um, I did for about nine months to a year when I was, um, I was, I worked on the Tour de France. I worked on part of the Tour de France stuff. So when I was doing that, we were in the town hall in Leeds and they didn't have showers. So I actually did use the baby wipe thing for about a year, hopefully. Nobody really noticed that I was doing anything different, but I had to use the baby wipe thing, but I did get away with it and it worked OK. But showers are absolutely definitely better. Um, make sure there's somewhere to store your bike, um, um, which probably um, which we're lucky to have certainly at Wellington House um, or we will be when it's been refurbished and we were um, when I worked for Lee City Council. Um, but also if you are showering, um, cleaning up, make sure there's somewhere you can keep your towels, your shower gel, your clothes um, and take those in before. Don't bring them on your bike, otherwise you'll have a very big rucksack. Bring them in beforehand. The really obvious one is buy a bike, um, but buy a bike that suits the route that you're doing. Um, so that could be a mountain bike, it could be a hybrid bike, it could be a road bike. Um, or I think Leah mentioned it as well seriously consider a, an e-bike now if you if you're not quite if you don't think you're quite fit enough buy an e-bike now and that'll certainly get your fitness up i've got a couple of mates that come out on the e mountain bike e-bikes who have just built up and built up their fitness and it's surprising how quickly they build the fitness up by by doing that um, and also if you're doing larger distances as well they're great for that um, i personally have three bikes a full suspension a hard tail and then a commuter bike um, but the old joke is that um the um, the best amount of bikes is n plus one for a, a serious cyclist. So you've never you've never got enough bikes as a as a cyclist apparently. Um, buy the right kit, obviously. If you are doing what I do, certainly make sure you've got some waterproofs, got some comfortable shorts. Um, don't wear cotton t-shirts. Wear a, a t-shirt that wicks because there's nothing more uncomfortable than a wet 
cotton t-shirt, um, particularly um, from either sweat or rain. Personally, um, I don't want to start a debate off, but I would always wear a helmet. I would never go anywhere without a helmet. Um, you can fall off anywhere, as I've proven. It can be just going along the road. You can always hit your head on a, a curbstone or something like that. So always wear a helmet. Um, and the good thing about the cycle to work scheme that Leah mentioned is that you can actually get the kit. You can get your kit as well. You don't. It's not just the bike you can buy. You can buy the kit through that. And it is a really good system. Uh, buy good lights because you could always get caught out. Um, you could end up going on early in the morning or late at night or even if it's um, raining it can get quite dark so they are definitely worthwhile uh, getting some good lights probably learn some basic man bike maintenance you will probably get a puncture at some point so at you need at least need to do that there's loads of stuff on youtube anything you want to do on a bike you can just go just look at youtube and you'll find information on it um, my big tip actually which probably won't mean much to most people is go tubeless it's one of the best things that was invented for bikes ever. Um, I wouldn't be without it now. Um, and nearly there, be responsible, be safe and be courteous on the road. Um, car drivers generally don't like bikes, so please do as much as you possibly can to make um, to make them accept you. Um, and also, particularly when you're coming through town centres, watch out for pedestrians. They do like to walk out on you. You have to have eyes in the back of your head. Um, and treat all drivers with caution. Do have eyes in the back of your head, really watch what they're doing. Um, and the other one is don't wear headphones. Don't listen to music when you're on the road. Off road, fine, but not on the road. Sorry, I sound as if I'm preaching now, don't I? Sorry, a lot of cyclists do this, I think. And then finally, very finally, enjoy it. You will feel better for it. There's no doubt about that. Um, and it's amazing how much more you notice of your local surroundings when you're out on a bike rather than being stuck in a car or on the train or whatever. Um, and you will discover new things of your of your local area and start enjoying them a bit more, even in your leisure activities. That's me done. Thanks very much. Thank Any questions? Thank you, Chris. That's, great. That's, um, yeah, thank you for sharing your experience and some great details there as well, particularly like, the, you know, when you're cycling in and you forget about work because you, you're concentrating on the road itself. So it is true. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to run one more poll, the final poll, and then we'll hand over to Mumtaz. So I'm just going to fire up that poll and everyone should be able to see that now. So what support would most encourage you to, to cycle to work? So if you're currently not cycling, what would help you? Again, it's multiple choice. OK, I can see people reply now. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll hand over to Mumtaz now. I'll just share the slides. Hopefully everyone can see that. Hi, that all good, Mumtaz? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Mumtaz. Um, my day job is I do sports coaching and run a martial arts club. Um, part of that club is we have a community cycling club named On A Bike. OK, um, just moving on to the next slide, please. So in terms of improving confidence for people making that transition from cycling and into commuting, adult cycling sessions have proven quite successful in terms of looking at, uh, just go back to the other slide, please. So it's a case of when you look at the level one and just building confidence, then going on to level two in terms of working on and cycling on uh, quieter roads and then progressing on to level three, which is kind of the busy, road, busy roads and navigating across uh, roundabouts, etc. And seeing that transition and people actually building the confidence and the lady in the bottom right, um, Sam Hunter, uh, was actually a case study for City Connect, somebody who hadn't been able to ride um, in August last year and then through the pandemic was committed to learning to ride and not only learn how to ride a bike but actually then started commuting 
uh, by bicycle and you know, having all the benefits in terms of the physical side aspects, again, fitter, but also the mental health benefits of cycling, which we've not touched upon yet. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So in terms of making any kind of cycling journey, uh, just quoting um, Alexander Graham Bell, you know, without anything else, preparation is the key to success. And if you know if you fail to prepare, there's bound to be something going on. And then you're thinking, oh, shucks, I need this. Or I should have packed this or packed that. And hindsight's a wonderful thing. So the very first thing that we go on to is in terms of checking the bike. Just move on. And there are another options. Ringo, thank you. Uh, so we have something which is known as an M-check. Those of you familiar with cycling, it's just a case of following the frame from the first um, set. Uh, from, if you imagine the bike frame goes up and down, so you're checking that the quick release is on and making your way all the way through the bike. But also there's a quicker version, uh, which is referred to the A, B, C, D, and A is checking the air, B is checking for the brakes, C is checking your chain, and D, uh, which is always the trick question, is literally picking the bike up and just doing a little drop. And if anything falls off, then there's a big clue for you. But you tend to kind of understand and, and relate to your bike and you get to know it. So you'll be familiar with how it should sound. So if it sounds kind of clunky or something's happened, you can just double check if there's some screws that need to uh, tighten in. Just move on, please. OK, and again. Now. As uh, mentioned by Craig as well, it's important to know where you're actually going to. And it's not often that you'll just have a straight from A to a Z route um, and a straight linear one. And sometimes you might need to kind of do a little bit of a zigzag or a detour. Um, but not knowing your route, you could end up doing something like this. And I'm notorious for getting lost. So add time to your journey. Um, in terms of looking and knowing the route beforehand, there's some really good Google Maps uh, does it as well, because you have when you do your destinations, you have the option of putting in the cycling and it'll give you uh, various ones. So you can actually pick and it shows the kind of gradients um, of the actual cycle. Right. So, you know, if you're not if you're looking for a challenge and you're wanting to go up a massive hill, uh, then you can opt for that one or you can take a more leisurely route. Um, but also Strava, I find, is a really good app because what it does, it logs uh, other people's rides. So you can see if there's certain routes that are actually popular in terms of use by cyclists. And for those that are competitive as well, you can actually set segments. So you can actually say, well, if I'm on this particular road, I'll go, you know, I'll try and beat my previous time. But obviously, bearing in mind your safety at all times as well. Moving on. Okay, um, this is my personal book bit. It's not actually happened to me in terms of having my bike ever stolen. Um, you know, I watch my bike like a hawk. And one of the things it's like, you know, even uh, representing in the polls that were on earlier on, 40% um, indicated that, you know, they would possibly consider commuting to work if there were the right facilities, i.e. showers um, or bike storage. And as we can see in the chat there as well, looking at bike storage lockers it's at 20 percent um you know so it's actually in second place to segregate the cycleways so with having segregated cycleways i think would be great for those um that maybe lack confidence on the road um but you know likewise even if you're confident on the road it's nice it's not that you kind of switch off thinking about traffic but you know you visit as you certainly feel a lot safer at uh, cycling on them and if there's two of you cycling together then you know, you're able to kind of chat along as well. It's a lot easier. But if you're going to work and then there's nowhere safe to actually park your bike um, or you're constantly thinking, you know, I'm sure because somebody's going to be taking parts off it, um, then this is kind of in my, you know, in an ideal world, something like this where you have automated uh, eco storage and your bike actually goes into, you know, some, a contraption like this where nobody can get to it other than yourself and i think you know that's the way forward for cities and certainly uh, larger organizations that can afford to do something like this um if it was kind of common and you knew that wherever you go there's safe parking i think a lot more uptake would actually be there okay moving on 
as mentioned earlier as well um, by our presenters in terms of what to wear look if you look at Copenhagen and I have actually had uh, the benefit of being out there and cycling in there you know people just cycle and it's just normal um, you know they'll get out on the jeans in the heels and the skirts in the jackets whatever and they're just going out to cycle and I think the image of cycling in the UK is very kind of lighter focused it's like well you need to be wearing this or you need to be wearing that and where if I'm going and doing say just a quick shop uh, trip to the local shops then I will tend to be in whatever I'm wearing so it might be tracky bottoms because that's my normal job um you know or it could be in jeans um but in terms of essential wear besides the helmet I'm you know I'm in, in agreement with Craig I wear my helmet all the time if we're coaching I make sure everyone wears a helmet um, but for me, the kind of the best thing that I ever bought was um, seal skin socks. And that was from commuting once from Batley to Bradford. And it started snowing and I was wearing trainers and my feet were freezing. Um, you know, my hands were OK. The rest of them was cold, but my feet were soaked. And uh, to the point that I kind of had to get off my bike and jump up and down. So um, I invested in buying these socks and they're absolutely brilliant so it's like I've never had cold socks uh, cold feet again and also having a rain jacket that's packable so you know if the weather changes uh, or it gets a little bit nippier you've got it and it doesn't really take a lot of space um, in terms of other essential kit um, what we've got here is you know if you look from kind of we'll go from top left and across so having a toolkit but also knowing what to do with it. It's no good having it on you, on you and then you think, well, I don't know how to fix a puncture. Um, having a puncture repair kit too. Um, having a first aid kit, I tend to carry one on my bike and I also have one in, in my car as well. And for years, I've never actually, you know, whenever you go, go past an accident and you're kind of like, does anybody need first aid? And you always go, no. Last week, I went past somebody and they're like, do you need first aid? And they're like, yes. Like, finally I get to use my first aid kit um, but it's not it's just for yourself and you could potentially help other people too um, once again going on to the bike locks investing in a good bike lock um, but not just for the bike frame you know connect your wheels in there as well as that picture that we had earlier on you know they'll take everything and just leave the back wheel and um, so it's a case of keep everything locked up and I tend to wire mine through the bike at wheels this is my kind of paranoia and it up, goes up through the seat as well so there's absolutely no way unless they've got an axle grinder and they're going to actually go through um, and even then I tend to keep an eye on my bike um, or make sure I park it with the CCTV camera. Um, having some money uh, with you as well so cash, coins um, and credit card because you just never know uh, what you might need as if you're out and about you might take them food and then you're needing something else or you might have, um, you know, you might have something in terms of needing repairs or you're just not feeling well somewhere and you might need to get transportation back. So always carry money. And also, there's no point having an inner tube or a puncture repair kit if you don't have a bike pump because you've got to be able to pump up your tyres. There are canisters available nowadays as well where you can just kind of attach it and have them and it blows up your tyres for you. Um, but I just prefer the pump. Um, it's easier. It doesn't cost much and you can use it over and over again. Okay, um, in addition to this, okay, it's just making sure um, that you also have uh, fuel, um, so, you know, having little snacks, etc. If it's a hot sunny day, don't take chocolate. It'll all melt and it'll be all over the place. So, you know, things like flapjacks are really good. Um, they, are, they do have fuel bars as well. And making sure that you've got enough water um, or if you're cycling and you, you know you go past the shop and you know you're going to be low on water, it's like top up. Um, the last thing you want to do is what we know as um, you know hitting the wall. Is you're out on your bike for a couple of hours, you've not been drinking, you're not been eating, and then all of a sudden your body just shuts down and goes, I've had enough. I'm not doing anything else. And you just look at that bike and you look at a hill and you think, I need to get home. So you know we eat regularly um, and drink regularly too. In terms of other things that, um, you know, I would recommend deodorant, uh, you know, because if you're actually cycling, you don't have the luxury of having a shower where you're going, um, then, you know, just freshening up, uh, baby wipes, etc. are good as well. And lights on a bike, um, I have two, 
So I have one that's a USB charge and they're rechargeable. And then as a backup, I have batteries. And then as a backup to that, I also carry batteries, not just for me, but because obviously teaching other people, um, if their batteries go, then it's okay that we can replace them. So there's a lot to carry. But at the same time is that when you do go out on your bike and you get to work or you get to wherever you are, I think mentally you are more alert and you just kind of, you've got one of your exercise sessions out of the way, done, dusted. So you're not stressing about trying to keep fit because you're actually doing it as part of your process. And it just becomes a habit. So, you know, doing it for, say, try it for a week and then add on another week. And after a month, you know, it's become a behavior. It just becomes the norm. So everybody's capable of doing it. And in terms of checking out routes as well, I would try doing your work route or your commute route on a Sunday when the traffic is quiet and build your confidence that way. And if there's work colleagues that live near you or where you can actually join forces and meet them at some point, then do that as well because it makes it more fun if you're trying to someone along the way. Uh, final slide is just to say thank you to uh, both City Connect and Cycling UK, um, you know, because they've been able to fund the work that we do. Um, on a bike within the community and as a result of that you know we've done numerous doctor bike sessions and given away I think it's probably over 600 bikes working with a number of partners and um, so it's a case of support is required by community groups thank you Yeah, thank you, Mum Tars. Uh, I've heard uh, you speak a few times and it never fails to inspire me what you've done and what you achieved to try and encourage others to, to cycle. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll hand over, well, any questions really? So I'm just looking through the chat now and I can't see any uh, questions so far from uh, anyone. Um, I have a question for the panel. Um, I guess for me, I. I, I got more into cycling more so since uh, lockdown but how do you keep yourself motivated when the weather turns really bad and you know apart from having the kit how do you you know you get up in the morning and how do you how do you motivate yourself to get out there when it's raining and horrible weather and anyone on the panel <laughs> I, I was gonna say I, I my 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 worst it's, it's kind of coming home I think sometimes I'm on the train it's quite warm we get off at the station uh, the rain's tipping down. I know I've got to cycle up the hill and into the, especially if the wind's coming in the wrong direction as well. Um, but actually, once I've got, I, I, I know that at least just a couple of minutes into the journey, I'll be glad I've, I'll be, I'll still be okay. I'll be glad I've done it. I mean, that my journey at the moment isn't very, isn't very long, but actually I, I kind of, it's one of those things you never regret if you look back, you never regret doing it. You know what I mean? It's uh, There's two types of fun, isn't there? Type one fun and type two fun. And type one's the fun you enjoy at the time. And type two's the thing you go, I'm glad I did that afterwards. And I think I would classify it as type two fun. And if you can get that perspective, then I think that's what gives you the motivation. Well, thank you. I, right I, I, I always look at it as well in that um, if you were walking, you'd get wet and you'd be in your suit and you'd get your suit wet. And, if you've got your bike kit on, you're only getting your bike kit wet and you've got somewhere, you get home quicker and you've got a shower waiting at the end if you want it. So um, yeah, that's what, it doesn't bother me at all. It's a free shower at the end of the day, isn't it? <laughs> that's great, thank you. Um, Caroline, you've got a question. Yes, I just wanted to ask, and it's probably one more for Leah and Montaz, but how do you deal with um, very busy intersections because if I was to commute from my house to my nearest train station, it's quite a nice little route, but there's a very busy intersection in the middle of it. Um, yeah, how do you deal with that without freaking out? There's, um, there's a number of options. One is obviously the road positioning. So making sure that you're in your primary position. So you know, you're, you're controlling and you're taking that space to keep yourself safe to nav uh, navigate through. But also, you know, there's no shame in terms of any cyclist that if they're coming to a specific point or a particular roundabout that, you know, worries them. You can always get off your bike and just walk around it, um, you know, and then just pick up on your journey again. Um, but this is where adult cycling instructions, you know, really, really um, important. 
and can actually help build confidence because a lot of the times people just don't realise the position that they should be in. And once it kind of makes sense of like, oh, if I'm approaching a roundabout, this is what I need to be doing and this is how I, I go around it and all the checks that they need to do. You know, it just makes things easier. And going back to what Craig said as well, it's like, you know, it's making that eye contact with drivers, being courteous, smiling. You know, the number of times I've been on the road and you're kind of coming up to a junction and you're thinking, oh, gosh. Um, but because you're communicating with the drivers, it's the case of, you know, that they kind of just slow down and let you on and get on with it. And as long as you put your hand up to say thank you and a little nod, you know, and they're doing the same as well. Because no, no driver wants to have their car scratched by a cyclist. So they'll give you a berth. What freaks them out is if somebody's inconsistent and just kind of moves out without giving any prior warning. So it's the case of, you know, being able to manage the road and share it with drivers. Um, you know, and also understand that not all drivers hate cyclists, even though we're led to believe that sometimes. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's I think a lot of the time people are people are frightened and that's that drivers are frightened by what might happen. Um, and, that, and that's why they would sort of beep at you or whatever. But it is it's pretending to almost pretending as if you were taking the same space as a car, isn't it? And getting out into the middle of that lane. And just giving everyone a little wave behind you, and that that that's how I'd handle that. Having said that, I, you know, if I'm cycling with my children, and I I I think you have to have a certain amount of confidence that you can move fast enough through the traffic to be able to to kind of keep up with that. And if you can't, say say I'm with my children, then I would get off and walk because they wouldn't um they they wouldn't be able to kind of have that confidence, I think, or or the speed required. So you build that up. But no shame in walking either. Okay, I think I got, saw Malcolm's hand was up previously, but he's, uh, yeah, Malcolm, you got a question? Yeah, I put it up, I took it down because mum's has really covered points I wanted to make. Um, okay. What I would say, I commute every day that I'm able to on my bike. I might have work commitments preventing me doing it. I'm, I'm about a 50 mile a week now uh, from a, a big cycling family, but my advice would be to not buy a bike and keep it the day after you bought the bike. Get used to the bike first and, and get used to your riding and encouraging it. You never see anybody on a bike, I don't think, that doesn't smile as well, which is a good point. And that's a, everyone seems to smile when they ride a bike. However, um, read the Highway Code. Uh, great advice about them junctions. I think that was, uh, uh, was it Caroline who said that? Or later, get off the bike if you need to. I cycle through Tingley Roundabout every day, top of the motorway junction there. There is a cycle path that goes around that. Some commuters, there's different classes of commuters, are uh, faster commuters, I'd say, uh, ignore a lot of cycle lanes, which I do. I think the Leeds Bradford cycle lane, I'm sorry to say this, is terrible in places, absolutely terrible. Uh, not designed by a cyclist for a cyclist. Uh, so if I ride that road, I, I ride on the road, which I'm conscious that it might annoy drivers because they see a cycle route and a cyclist not on it. So we have to be aware that even though what we do, um, so, so uh, it can irritate other road users uh, and because we're correct as well with the highway code and, and there are sections where we, we know we're correct please don't stick to your guns if it makes you vulnerable because we're just vulnerable uh, i'll get off and i'll walk through a junction like somebody suggested it's the best thing to do uh, rather than no i'm right and i'm sticking to my guns because i'm right it just irritates drivers which causes loads of problems so yes i'm prepared to roll over I can be quite aggressive uh, when I'm riding at certain times away home. Cyclists can be, uh, but you have to have that commanding position on the roads. Uh, but enjoy it and don't commit yourself to commuting the day after you buy a bike. Get used to your bike first and, and riding on a Sunday. We traffic out on Sunday with my family, with my wife, and we do hundreds of miles. And, and it's, it's such a pleasure to do. But I know how vulnerable I am when I'm with car drivers. And there are car drivers out there who, um, and don't go through it like, um, that's what just annoys people. I consider I'm a bit of a, um ambassador to cycling when i'm on a road because i'm conscious that people watch me if, I, if i'm holding up traffic on a narrow section and I, on the 650 where i travel it's wagons and buses i'll get off and i'll walk and i'll ride a cycle on footpath even god forbid just to allow that traffic to move on and, and get out of the way that i'm not annoying people and i quite often get people who will thank me and wave to me when i do that and so just accept how vulnerable you are i believe and uh, enjoy it more than anything else and be in the wide awake club at all times Sorry, I'm no, going on, but everyone's no, 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 what no. to say, so that's it for me. I'm off. See you. No, 
Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, thank you for sharing those tips as well. So that's great. Uh, I am conscious of time, so um, I appreciate everybody taking the time to attend this session and especially the, the, the speakers, uh, Mumtaz, Leah and Craig for volunteering to, to share their experiences. So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, we will follow up with an email. So if you need any support or anything like that, then we're, we're here to support you as well, helping your workplaces, you know, whether it's getting grants for uh, shower facilities, bike lockers, or if it's uh, training, adult cycling training, things like that, we can help facilitate that as well. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And we're just going to finish up with um, a little video that uh, hopefully Ringo will be able to play. Um, I'm apologising now for my screechy Scottish accent in it. Um, but it's just to remind everybody that uh, do you remember the joy of learning to ride a bike? This is my son learning to ride a bike. So if you haven't been on a bike for years, <laughs> remember this and, and give it a go. I don't know if you could hear it, Ringo, could you? I could hear it. Could you hear it? No, we couldn't. Do you have to press the sound button? Yeah, the I think we do. Try that again then. Take two. No. No. Can't well, hear that, it. That's unfortunate. Well, it was just me um, being very excited about managing to teach him to ride, but it's just to remind everybody of how you may have felt when you were a child and you first learned to ride and if you haven't done it for years to give it a go again but thank you very much very much everyone for attending it's been a really good session thank you, yep. thank thank you, you all thank you thank you take care thank you thanks everyone thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. bye.